I want to talk about partnerships for a few minutes. This class is about race and it is about race with an eye to justice. And as the people of God, we believe that God is a just God. And we believe because of that, we are to pursue justice in the world. Uh, how would the Lord want society to be structured? Uh, one of the things that his word tells us, Proverbs 11.1 1, says that the Lord detests, he hates dishonest scales. Older translations say that dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord. And that proverb is about justice. Uh, the Lord hates it. He, he is profoundly moved to anger when some people are given favorable treatment over others. And it is my conviction that systemic racism has done that very thing in our country. And as the people of God, part of our calling to be a people of justice is to seek to address this injustice and to work for justice. Now, that first is a calling for us to work within the church. Is the church itself, are our congregations, just communities? Is the church a place where everybody and various groups of people are treated fairly and treated equitably? But it also means that we are called to work for justice outside of the church, in our city, and in our nation and in the world. And when we do this, we must immediately deal with the question of partnerships. Now, this requires first and foremost a posture of humility. Uh, we need to go out into the world and not ask first, Lord, what do you want us to do? But Lord, where are you already at work? In what people, in what organizations, and what institutions and groups are you already working and seek to join ourselves to the Lord's work there. And when we do this, we will find ourselves partnering with people and organizations that may surprise us. We, we have a tremendous example of this in scripture in the Old Testament books of Jeremiah and Daniel. Now, for any of you who know me, you'll know that I love Daniel and I love Jeremiah, particularly Jeremiah 29. Uh, Jeremiah 29 was a letter that God sent through the prophet Jeremiah to the Jewish exiles that were exiled from Jerusalem and that were living in Babylon. And they didn't want anything to do with Babylon. They just wanted to live by themselves away from the city in a little enclave and there were false prophets who came to them and said, you don't have to worry about Babylon. A couple of years is going to go by and then God's going to take you back to Jerusalem. It's all going to be good. And God comes to them through the prophet Jeremiah and says, I didn't send those prophets. They're telling you lies in my name. And God says, what I want you to do is I want you to seek the peace of the city. I want you to seek the peace of Babylon. Uh, the word peace there, some of you may know, is the wonderful Hebrew word shalom. Uh, shalom means life as it should be, flourishing. It means justice. It means mercy. It means humility. And that's what they were to seek on behalf of Babylon. They were to work for it and they were to pray for it. And then the book of Daniel, really, we see this calling being lived out. Uh, the book of Daniel opens up with Daniel, who was a very intelligent young man. He was one of the exiles from Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, the Babylonian Empire saw in him and many others like him his talents and his gifts and abilities. So they brought him into, them into service for the Babylonian Empire, Emperor Nebuchadnezzar. And we see from the very first chapter of Daniel that these exiles were actually had become partners with the Babylonian government. They had become workers of the Babylonian government. And Daniel actually rises to the place of roughly equivalent to prime minister. He becomes the emperor's right-hand man. And I want us to feel the weight of this. Uh, in the Old Testament, 
uh, Babylon was one of the arch enemies of God and his people. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his empire served the Babylonian god Marduk. Uh, they were ruthless, uh, all the way going back to the Tower of Babel. Uh, in Genesis 10 and Genesis 11, we see that they stand for everything that the Lord is opposed to. Yet nonetheless, as they were seeking the peace of Babylon, Daniel and his friends and his colleagues found themselves working for this government. Uh, we see them taking on Babylonian names, and these names were actually, if you translate them, they were prayers and praises to various Babylonian gods. Uh, we see them studying the language and literature of the Babylonians, which this wasn't like what we would think literature. This was they were uh, being educated in the art of divination, of being able to uh, take an animal and kill the animal and pull the animal's organs out and look at spots on the organ to figure out what the gods were up to at any point in time. So as they were partnering with the Babylonian government, they found themselves doing things that were quite shocking. And other Jews probably living in Jerusalem would probably go, is it okay for them to do that if they have they already had their faith co-opted by the Babylonian system and the Babylonian regime? But also it's important to see in that story that Daniel and his friends, they drew the line at key points. In chapter one, uh, Daniel refuses to eat the king's food, the rich food of the king. He only says, just only feed me vegetables and water. In other instances, uh, Daniel was given an order to stop praying uh, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he refused. Uh, and he was thrown into the lion's den. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego uh, did not bow down to a statue of the king, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. So we, we see points of uh, disagreement that they had, and they said, we are going to go far with you. Uh, but we're not going to do everything that you ask us to do. Uh, so we did see that they were exercising discernment and faith and even willing to take courageous stands. But in the big picture, we see them throughout the book in these partnerships with uh, pagan empires towards common goals, uh, pursuing the peace of Babylon. And I think this is a very important lesson for us. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, some of you may know that name. He was a pastor in the middle part of the 20th century. And he came up with two really helpful categories for working for justice in the world. And those categories were allies and co-belligerents. And for him, an ally was someone who was a fellow Christian but maybe a Christian of a different denomination or a different set of beliefs, maybe things that we would even disagree quite sharply with them about, but a fellow Christian, um, believer in the Apostles' Creed and so forth. And he said an ally is somebody that you can go pretty far down the road with uh, and, and work together. A co-belligerent, on the other hand, and this is the way that he described it in one of his writings, he said, a co-belligerent is a person with whom I do not agree with on all sorts of vital issues. So there's lots of things that we disagree about, but who, for whatever reasons of their own, is on the same side in a fight for some specific issue of public justice. That's what a co-belligerent was. So we can disagree about all number of things, but at least in one area, we are in agreement and we can fight together for that common cause. And I think this is absolutely and vitally necessary for us. As we pursue racial justice in Seattle, as we pursue it in our nation, as we pursue it in our workplaces, it, require, it will require us to make all kinds of partnerships. Uh, partnerships with individuals to be sure, uh, but also at some points we may be uh, partnering with in some limited way with some larger organizations and institutions. 
And I believe that scripture actually not only gives us the freedom to do this, but gives us a paradigm for doing this of engagement where there is uh, significant disagreement on very important things. There were a lot of things that Daniel disagreed with Nebuchadnezzar about, no doubt. Uh, but there also is a partnership, a pursuing of a common cause together. Now, I'll, I'll start with maybe one of the most controversial uh, groups for Christians during uh, this present moment. Uh, if you take, for example, the organization uh, Black Lives Matter, a lot of Christians uh, don't want anything to do with the organization Black Lives Matter, all kinds of beliefs about Marxism and wanting to dismantle the nuclear family and so forth. Uh, those are disputed points. I'm sure a lot of you know a lot more about that than I do. But here's the thing. I don't believe that you or I have to agree with every aspect of what an organization like that believes in in order to join them in an effort to seek racial justice and fight against white supremacy. Those are two things that I think we have common cause with and we can work together to fight for those things. Fight for racial justice and fight against white supremacy. I think there is a lot of overlap there. We can disagree about a lot of things. We can have frank, open and honest conversations about those things, but nonetheless, we can partner with them. And I do think this is a topic that requires, when, when we do this, it, we have to grant each other a considerable amount of Christian freedom and liberty of conscience. And I think we see that in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel made certain stands that his friends didn't make, and his friends made other stands that we don't see him making. Maybe they weren't in the same situation, or maybe they were, and they just came to different conclusions. So we need to be able to offer one another that same uh, liberty of conscience, that same Christian freedom. But the question is this, and it's really an approach uh, that's rooted in common grace. Uh, it's rooted in the common humanity we have as image bearers of God. And we have to ask ourselves the question, where do I have common ground with this organization or this person? Where does our common humanity as image bearers of God overlap in a way that would allow us to work alongside of one another towards a common goal?